Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Small Cap Discoveries conference call. Today on our call, we have Kyle Hall, the CEO of Ineotech. Ineotech trades on the TSX Venture Exchange under the symbol INEO and on the OTC under INEOF. The company is trading at 41 cents with roughly 41 million shares outstanding or about a $17 million market cap. I'd now like to hand it over to Paul Andriola. Hey, great. Thanks, Trevor. Um, yeah, Ineotech. Uh, a name that uh, I'm not super familiar with, but um, we've got great opportunity here to speak to Kyle Hall and uh, get to know the business as well as we can here. So um, Kyle, uh, when we all can be here and I understand that you've got a presentation for us, why don't you uh, take it away? Great, thanks guys, appreciate the intro. Thanks for having me on your show. So INEO is founded about four years ago, a little over four years ago, and we do targeted digital advertising analytics, but integrated to theft detection devices at the front entrance of retail stores. It's all about gaining access to the very front entrance of the store, and the price of admission is being inside of those retail theft detection devices, which I'll talk to you about in a few minutes. We've got 75 store network deployed in Western Canada to prove out um, our systems, operationally show how it works for the major retailers. And we just signed a, a deal with a, um, a large multinational um, security company called ProSecure to help us do our rollouts within the US and, uh, and in Europe. Um, we went public on the TSXV via an RTO last January. Um, we raised 2.8 million at that time. And uh, that's kind of the, the main background on the overview of the company. Myself, I, um, pre previous to this, I, I started and developed a company called PNI Digital Media, grew it from eight people to 200 people, took it from the TSX to our TSXV to the TSX, and then we sold the Staples in 2014. Worked for them for a couple of years. And that company, we dealt with all the major retailers in the world. We did all the online photo finishing services for you name a retailer, and this, this Vancouver company called PNI had done it for them. Um, when I left Staples, I got in touch with an old friend of mine who had, um, who's Greg, and Greg had, he'd built a career out of doing RF and RFID solutions for tracking inventory on the manufacturing floor of aerospace companies. So, you know, manufacturers such as Boeing and McDonnell Douglas, and he was looking for something to apply his expertise to, and he'd arrived at these theft detection devices at the front entrance of retail stores. And again, I'll, I'll tell you more about that in a minute, but I uh, saw that what Greg was doing, he patented some technology and we built a company off of that. When I was at Staples, I got to know Steve Mattias, who was the CEO of Staples uh, quite well. And Steve joined our board when we went public. And shortly thereafter, Serge Gatesco was the former national managing partner of um, P PwC Canada. He joined our board as well. So solid team, we're 19 people. So not huge, but 19 people, very heavy on the R&D side today. So what do we do? We've built um, these systems that replace, you know, when you walk in the front of a retail store and there's, there's these gates, these sensors, and there would be a tag on clothing. You walk through the door and the, the, the tag beeps because you, you have, the store isn't taking the tag off the clothing. Those systems at the front entrance of retail stores are 20, 25 year old technology, antiquated technology. They don't work very well. And so Greg was playing around with RF, RFID signals to say, I can make those things so much better. But when we looked at it, we said, we don't want to sell hardware. We want to put something at the front entrance of the store that allows us to get recurring revenue out of it. And so Greg came up with the idea of like, let's put a big LED screen in them so we can sell advertising. All the literature in the industry says you can't do that. These theft detect detection devices are very sensitive to any kind of radio noise. So you can't put computers near them. You can't put the power supply for LED lights near them. And you certainly can't put a big LED screen in the middle of them. Greg figured out a way to do it and he patented it. And that's what we've built. We call it a welcoming system. So it's the first thing a customer sees as they walk in, but it also still does the loss prevention. And we've packed it with, with sensors and processing capabilities so that we can actually detect customers as they come in the store and give the store accurate uh, counts of who's coming and going from their stores. So that's the base product. Here's a picture of one in the front end of a liquor store in, in, um, in Vancouver. And you know, like I said, it's the first thing they see, the last thing they see before they leave the store. And these systems, you know, the stores today are running messaging for the stores, are running their specials on them. We're selling advertising on them. They've got their Instagram feeds on them. Um, we're tied into the Canadian alert network. So severe weather warnings, amber alerts, whatever kind of messaging and feedback we need to give to customers within the store, we can display on these screens. As I said, the price of admission is being good at loss prevention because we want that space at the front entrance of the store. And that space is reserved for these legacy loss prevention systems. And so you know, we, want, we want to get rid of those. Those systems are just dumb systems today. They just, they, they just detect a tag and they beep. That's all they do. We put our systems in, they're connected. So every time an alarm goes off, we note, we note the event in an online dashboard. We actually grab 10 seconds of video each side of the alarm event. 
so that the store can go back and review their alarm events. They can analyze them. They can download the video. They can send the video off if they want to prosecute or you know, send somebody else to analyze. We trend the data. We show them you know, when their alarms are going, if there's any trending in there. You know, maybe at 4 o'clock every day, alarms are going to better put somebody, position somebody near the front of the store to prevent from loss. So we're, we're, we're extending the capabilities of loss prevention, but we're only doing that because we want to reserve that spot at the front of the store. And when we reserve that spot, everybody has to walk by it. And so what we've done is we're generating data that retailers have that they are, need to have to operate the business. When I was at Staples, I was shocked that they had very little data about went on the stores. E-commerce wise, they had all the data you would expect. But if you ask them what's their conversion rate in stores, all they had was cash register info. So things like, do you convert better if you add a salesperson on the floor? Do you convert better if you make traffic, to people entering the store turn right versus left? Do you, make, do you convert better if you put a better sign on, on the first uh, uh, aisle that they see? They couldn't answer any of that data. So we're actually giving the retailers that data by having these systems at the front of the store. We're also tying it in with census data, weather data, and even mobile device traffic to, to give them a better picture of you know, what the location is that they're, they're in, where that store is in, what's the, 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 the general traffic around it, and then where's their traffic coming from and where's their traffic going to. So kind of compiling all this information in some nice visual data visualization uh, interfaces so that the retailer can actually understand who their customers are, what's happening with their customers, and trend this over time. So in order to showcase this, we built a 75-store liquor store network in Western Canada. In, in Western Canada, most of the, the liquor stores are independents, and they all use loss prevention systems. So we basically went into the liquor store and said, let's take this old device out. We're going to give you this device. It's going to give you advertising, it's going to give you traffic counting, and it's going to give you loss prevention. And for that, we want to be able to sell advertising on those screens. We signed up 75 of them. We're now putting over 3 million people a month through those liquor stores that we're tracking in and out. Liquor stores, of course, in the age of COVID have gone a little bit crazy with their traffic. You know, you can't get liquor at bars, you can't get liquor at restaurants for the most part. So uh, there's a lot of traffic in liquor stores right now. And it's actually been really good for our AI and training our AI. We're probably four months ahead of where we thought we'd be on the training of the AI. If we get a waist down shot of somebody right now, we're 90 plus percent accurate in de de detecting gender. It's picking up on cues like shoes and clothing and things like that. So, but we built this liquor store network. And in the meantime, it's become a really nice little business for us, but we built this because we wanna showcase to the major multinational retailers how this technology works and what we can do with it. And in that vein, we just recently signed a letter of intent with Prosegur. Prosegur is a 4.2 billion euro company doing security uh, based in Madrid, Spain. They have good business in the UK, France, Spain, Latin America, and they just entered the US market by buying some loss prevention companies, companies that sell those old school sensors that I was telling you at the front of the store. They saw our technology and they said, that's the perfect way to change this business from selling hardware to getting recurring revenue, but also as a means for them to gain market share and take market share from other, um, from other providers. And so, um, we just recently signed that. We've set, shipped them the test units that they're putting into the first stores, and they're going to take over the manufacturing, the distribution, and installation of it. So that will make them, we'll, we'll relieve ourselves of the hardware. They'll take the hardware component of it, and we'll become a pure SaaS company delivering a media network to display advertising and data analytics capture company. So how does the business work? For the independent stores that we signed up, we're, like I said, we're giving them the system, we're giving them 15% of the screen time to run their stuff, and we're giving them the data analytics and the loss prevention. For that, we get 85% of the screen time. We're just selling that to advertisers. We've got a contract with one of the largest breweries in the world. We've got a contract with one of the largest wineries and producers in Canada. And we're getting north of four, or $500 per month in advertising fees out of those stores. Cost of our unit to put it in there is about $2,500. So we pay it back in five or six months, and we're making money off of it. When we go to the large retailers, the, mo the model is going to change a little bit. Um, these large retailers already sell a lot of advertising to their vendors. They sell shelf space and end cap space, and they space in their flyer and space online. And so their marketing programs, their buyers and merchants will take over the selling the advertising. They will actually make money off these systems. We'll charge them a fee to have the, the system in there, whether it's us or ProSegur, our partners charge them a fee for the hardware, and then we'll charge our license fee on top of that for doing the media network, and the data analytics. They'll probably sell the, the advertising system for $1,200, $1,500 a month. And we'll probably only take around 500. So it'd be a money-making device for them. In COVID time, all these retailers have stopped printing their printed flyer for the most part. You used to be able to walk in the front of retail and pick up their flyers, you walk to the store. 
they stopped printing those and handing them out because of uh, you know, COVID, it just changed things. They're crying for more space to put advertising on within their store. We're gonna give them something right at the front entrance to the store. There's other target markets that we're gonna go after. Poster is gonna immediately take us into grocery market and home improvement. They have uh, two of the largest retailers in the US are already under contract there. And we're gonna, that's where our pilots are gonna install. Pharmacy is a great uh, vertical force. A lot of these are also essential services. So these retailers, regardless of what happens in the very near future of COVID or long-term retail, we're still gonna have grocery, we're still gonna have liquor, we're still gonna have home improvement, we're still gonna have pharmacy and beauty around. And there's thousands of stores and literally millions of these devices that we can replace. So as far as our technology, like I said, Greg put, played around with this when people told me you can't do it, but we had a patent granted in Canada and we've had it granted in the US and we filed for Europe. The interesting thing about this is it's a variety of different trade secrets and, and, and technology that we've had to make this work. Um, detecting a small tag in a sea of radio noise is not an easy feat, especially when you put a lot of other radio noise emitting devices in there. When ProSecure came to us, one of the things that they wanted also was to be able to prosecute, prosecute and defend our patents. They saw that as key. So they had their patent lawyers oversee, look over all of our, our, our filings and our patents. And they came back and said, you guys did a pretty good job. They're highly defensible. And they want to be able to defend those against any company that inter and, um, kind of treads on our space. Um, they know that some other large multinationals could try and bleed small companies like us with legal fees, but they're going to take over the prosecution of those patents. So today, we, our year end is uh, June 30th. And we, filed, we uh, reported a little over 500,000 revenue for last year, last fiscal year. This was all legacy revenue. Our advertising revenue just kicked in in, the, in Q2. Um, we got enough systems out there over last year that we built and we started selling the advertising. But we'd acquired a couple of companies to get in this space, a company called Provent in 2016 and Newman in 2020. And these were companies that sold those legacy loss prevention systems, but they had 600 customers. And that's where we got the liquor stores from. We basically bought those customers, went in and told the retailer, like, we're going to take that system out and put this in. And so that's where the legacy revenue came from. But going forward, the revenue profile is going to change drastically with us. And, and the margins are going to change. Um, we, as a SaaS company, we will generate probably in the 85 to 90% margin, gross margin area, probably in the 35 to 40% EBITDA margin. So if you look at those large retailers that we're going to install, you know, thinking, you know, the one grocery retail is about 2,700 stores. The home improvement retail is about 2,200 stores. We're, you know, we're closing in 5,000 stores. Even if it's $200 a month to us, that's probably, you know, 12 million annually um, of high, high margin SaaS revenue. And so that's where the business is heading to. Like I said, we went public in, um, in January, 2020. Um, if you can look at that start ch stock chart on the right, uh, we kind of did okay out of the gate and then COVID hit. Anything retail, anything tech, just went down at that time, of course. And so throughout last summer, we just deployed the network, we finished the technology, we refined the technology. And then as the vaccines were announced, we saw this massive uptick in not just investor interest, but also customer interest. The retailers are looking to invest in the business again. And we really accelerated a lot of conversations. So um, stock has started to move. Um, earlier this week, we announced uh, that we're going to do another placement. Um, uh, a $4 million, $4.5 million placement. Our cap table is very clean at this point in time. There's not a, a real much of any kind of overhang out there. And uh, we're looking forward to where the, the company is going to go in the next year. So that's pretty much it, guys. I'm, I'm open to questions. Um, I kind of talked fast. I ran through this pretty quick, but, uh, you know, uh, feel free to delve into any particular area that uh, I might not have given you enough detail on. No, perfect. Uh, Kyle, thank you. I think uh, you did a great job there um, uh, actually answering a lot of the questions that I had here. But why, why don't we just dive right into uh, a little bit more info on the, the competitive landscape? Maybe give us a sense of who you compete against and, and really what, what's the customer looking for when, when you know, you're up against somebody else? Yeah, good. I missed that. Um, out there in the retail world today, there's two companies, especially in North America, that are really at the, the forefront of the loss prevention side of things. A company called Sensormatic, owned by Johnson Controls, and a company called Checkpoint. And they probably, each of them, sell almost a billion dollars worth of hardware a year. So they, they basically sell that, hard, that hardware you see at the front of a retail store to detect, te um, detect theft. And they basically sell it and they have a little bit of maintenance. They walk away from it. We're actually going to take those systems out and put in ours, which has a recurring revenue. So those those are the two that we're really up against. And that's also why ProSecure wanted the right to defend our patents because they're worried if we start taking on those two majors that they're going to fight back, try and maintain the market share and they try to do something like we're doing. Without the advertising and without the analytics um, revenue streams in there, 
we don't think they can actually match our business model. Um, and we think we have an incredible advantage over them technology wise. So that's really who we're going after. If you, if you walk into any major retailer out there, you look at their systems and the name on the systems, it'll be Sensormatic or, or Checkpoint. ProSecure is one of the few that actually has an inroad in there. They bought that company in the US where they gained two major companies. Um, but uh, th those are the two that we're really going after. And then once we're in the store, we're, you know, we're, we're, you know, one of many that are trying to get some of that advertising dollars. And then we're also one of many trying to do analytics for the retailer. But ours is quite interesting in the fact that we don't have any upfront cost to the retailer for them to actually get those, the, these systems to get the analytics. And so um, we removed the CapEx from the retailer and we're giving them a revenue stream because they're gonna actually sell space on our system. Yeah, so, so I want to really be clear on this and, dive, and sort of double down on it. So, I mean, traditionally, any of these loss prevention systems, the stores are buying them, right? They're spending their dollar to get that. There's no revenue they generate from it other than they're saving whatever, you know, preventing theft. Mm -hmm. You guys are giving them an opportunity to get that same sort of technology, but technically generate some revenue for themselves instead of having to just fork out, you know, this, this CapEx. Is that correct? That's it. You nailed it right on. And then the other thing that we layer on top is giving them the data that they can actually use to run their businesses better um, and do uh, you know, more with, uh, with what they, they, you know, they've never had that data before at the store level. I mean, it, it sounds like such a no brainer. So maybe give us a sense of um, what's the process when your sales team goes out and knocks on one of these doors, you know, what, what's the process and what's the, the pushback? Yeah. So, you know, the, the biggest pushback was that we were this tiny company with unproven technology. And so, you know, I have had good relationships with quite a few of these managers, worked for Staples for years um, after they acquired us and, um, you know, went out immediately pitched to a lot of them and got a lot of really good feedback. Um, the biggest one is, you know, we need to prove out our technology. And that's what we did with the 75 uh, store liquor network. And now it's, a, it, it, we're working through the steps, right? And this device is going to be on the corporate network. The, those old devices, like I said, they plug them into a wall outlet and that's all they do. They're just dumb systems. And so now we're working through the IT department to make sure you know, we're whitelisting our IP so we can access them. We're safe and secure in the networks. That's why the, the pilot systems just shipped off to ProSecure's customers. And then after that, it's just get, really getting them comfortable around, you know, you know, how the advertising, how they can fill the advertising, how the interfaces work. So um, we're at that sweet spot right now. And that, that, that's why we're, you know, we're, we're actually promoting ourselves a little bit and happy to be on a show such as yourself because we've been very quiet. We've been under the radar. We're just getting these relationships going. And the company is on that edge now where, you know, we're going to sign a lot of big customers and we're going to deploy a lot of systems. So I would say one of the, the main interesting pushbacks that we had pre-COVID was some of the retailers went to say, well, maybe we'll have you sell the advertising and then you just give us a revenue share out of it. And I'm okay with that. That, that still works for me. But when COVID hit and the, the printed flyer disappeared, it immediately switched. Maybe we will take in all the advertising and maybe we will control all that because I think they saw the dollars that they could put into it. Yeah, no, no doubt. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing. It's amazing when you really dig in and see how much advertising revenue these, these, these retailers actually take for themselves in those opportunities. And yeah, I can see where uh, replacing the, the flyers makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. um, the... Um, so I, you mentioned that you get on average about five hundred dollars per month per store. Is that is that something we can sort of really model out? If if you're going to a big retailer and it has you know a uh, hundred stores across the country, is it safe to say okay if you landed there you're likely to get the the full hundred or two hundred stores and we times it by five hundred and that's your revenue? It's, you know. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, so. I'll step back one other step. As we were, like Greg was working through the technology, trying to figure it out, and I, I worked hard on the business model and how we were going to sell this, talking to you know, some of these friendly retailers that I knew and how we would get out there. And there's a company in the U.S. that was selling cardboard sleeves that they would put over the loss prevention systems. And cardboard's great because it doesn't interfere with radio signal or whatever, right? And so they had a contract with Rite Aid in the U.S., drugstore chain, and they would print these cardboard sleeves. They would ship them and get them installed every month. And we inquired and we got a little bit friendly with them and found out, and they were pulling 300 US over a piece of cardboard they were putting over these things. And if you look at all the big billboards downtown right there, they're owned by Patterson or their Bell Media, you know, all the old standard ones that they you know, paint up every month and put a new advertising message on, they're all going digital. And the reason they're going digital, even at that huge expense of putting in these dig massive digital screens, is they can get 10 times what they could get out of printed because they can run many messages on there. They can day part the message, you know, different messages at five to seven and versus nine to 10 in the morning. And they, they can just pull more money out of the same space. 
Well, we're going to see that over that $300 US that they're getting for cardboard because we, um, we can run five or six messages. We can rotate them through. We can run them at different times. We can charge for different times. We can charge more if it's sunny out and you've got a, you know, Coke wants to advertise when it's sunny or Campbell's Soup wants to advertise when it's cold. We can do things like that, right? And um, I, think, I think we'll get more than that eventually. And I think that's what the retailers are seeing now is that maybe they want to take ownership of that advertising and they can sell it. And at that point, we're fine being the, the, the SaaS player behind the scene, just providing the services, just providing, you know, the capability of running this network. Mm -hmm. um, it's just it appear, uh, sort of, I jumped on me here. Um, who controls the sort of the, the scheduling or who controls the actual system? Is that done remotely off site or is that done on site? Uh, does the retailer have any say in what gets advertised? What, what can you tell us here? Yeah, so we built a, um, a media network behind the scenes so that you can go in and schedule any of the screens. You can put, the, you know, take an ad, say, you know, which stores do we want this ad to run on? What time of day do we want this ad to run on? And it can all be scheduled remotely from one computer interface. And so for the liquor, independent liquor store networks, we do that ourselves today. We book the advertising, we place it, we sell it. We've given the independent liquor stores the right of refusal. So, you know, if, if they want to advertise Coke, but they only carry Pepsi, you know, we won't advertise Coke. They can tell us no. But if you look at the liquor stores out there and, and the brands that they have, they, they carry so many brands. You know, it's a very brand rich environment. So it hasn't actually been an issue. The retailers in the end, that's why I say they're, they're going to take that over. We're going to actually give them uh, a submission interface where they can go in and put their own advertising up and they can schedule it. So their own marketing people can do it if they want. If they don't, we will do it for them. Mm -hmm. But um, we've done it so that, um, so that the interface itself, you know, the, the software does this all. You, you don't have to, um, you know, have, have the stores do it. They don't have to take the time away from staff. If the store needs to put a message in up, there's a capability for them to have some, some screen time if the, if the store, if the, the chain wants to schedule that. So, you know, the store has the ability of putting up a message saying we're closing early today for inventory or something like that. They, they can do that if the head office wants to allow the stores to do it. Mm -hmm. Conversations I've had, typically they don't want to let them do that. They don't want, you know, inadvertent messaging beyond the store. They want to control mm -hmm. everything, but right. we'll see where some of that falls. Yeah, good point. Um, okay, so you mentioned COVID earlier. Uh, I typically have two questions around COVID. One is, how, how does it affect the operations of your business? Mm -hmm. And then what what differences or what's changed within the industry maybe due to COVID that uh, either is good or bad for your for your company? Yeah, I, I think like anything, you are we everything kind of froze when COVID first hit, right? Nobody knew what was going on. Kind of thing. We, we sent everybody home, everybody worked from home, but we're a tech company. So remotely, we can work our tech developers, the code repositories, everything's online. Our, we use Azure for our platform we were running. So it was, it was okay for us to keep going. We were also in early stages where we were at that time, point in time. Um, we focus on essential retailer, liquor store network. Um, some of our other retailers we're targeting are essential retailers that we, even in, in the event of a nether lockdown, these stores will stay open. Um, and so you are, our first, you know, really point of thrust is, is, is targeting those essential stores. Um, I said a couple of things that COVID actually, you know, helped in some regard. And this is a, a proper thing to even say in this market, but, you know, it changed, it's changed some, some patterns of behavior. It's changed, you know, those printed flyers. It's changed some things. So there's, there's some changes, you know, that are fundamentally happening in the market that I, we think it's going to help us especially in retail. Retail has been under fire for years. COVID you know, hammered retailers hard. Um, we're coming in and helping them put things into the business that they would need to invest a lot of money into to do. They need analytics. They need better messaging to their customers. You could say they even need better loss prevention. We're giving them all that under a model that actually will work for them. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Um, so you mentioned uh, you guys are doing a $4.5 million private placement right now. Uh, give me a sense of what you're going to use that money for. Yeah, so there's a few other R&D projects that we've been just parked. Where it's not, we don't have enough people. We don't have enough time to go after some of these things. And um, Greg's got a few more patents we need to file around this. But there's some line extensions that we can do within the stores themselves to do more. Um, once we get that placement at the front door, it, you know, it, it's all, we're really concentrating on that front entrance right now. But there's more the retailers want. They want like heat mapping the store. They want to know where people go within the store. And we've got some good plans for doing some of that. We've got processing power in the store. We've got, you know, the sensors in the stores and be able to, uh, to detect and track. And so we want to extend that. So there's some good R&D that we're going to use. We're going to use some of the capital to keep rolling up that liquor store network. I think it's making us money. So we're going to, we're going to extend the liquor store network to, you know, possibly another hundred stores or so. 
Um, but our, our, our focus is also very much on these large majors and these large majors want to know that we have a good balance sheet. You know, we, we can skim by and not spend a lot of money and, and make a lot of good gains ourselves. But when they analyze us, they want to know that we've got you know, money on the balance sheet that we're going to be around for a few years. Um, they're not going to have to worry about us going to business or something like that. So we're just firming up the balance sheet for the most part. Mm -hmm. um, uh, listen, I want to remind everybody that's listening today, uh, if you've got some questions, and we do have some questions, but if you've got some questions you want me to ask, uh, please use the chat function and I'll make sure Kyle um, uh, does his best to answer them. Um, the, um, what, what, if anything, do you think you still need, apart from the capital you're raising, um, is there any management, any, you know, any additional R&D? I mean, anything that you need, what, what do you still need to, to grow the business? Yeah, you know, we, we'll add a few people on the R&D side for sure. Uh, like I said, you know, we've got those projects lined up and we just don't have the manpower for it. So we'll, we'll add a few people there. Um, we've got some good people on the data side, but we need, to, we need a, a solid data scientist that's um, got a little bit more experience in some of these things than, than even the people that we have. Does. So, you know, there's, there's so much opportunity in the data side. When we look at the business, we say, you know, our, our price of admission, the Trojan horse is the loss prevention. That gets up that space in the front of the store. The immediate you know, path forward is selling the advertising, having advertising there, but the future is all the data analytics. Mm -hmm. And the data analytics, we believe, is going to be bigger than, than any other part of it in, in a few years to come. So a little more investment in that side. And, you know, like I said, a good data scientist that, um, that, that can really understand, um, you know, how to tie all these pieces together and, and make the, the insights and the predictability that we can offer to retailers out of it. Mm -hmm. um, well, let's take that further. So what, what um, uh, we always look for sort of the new initiatives or new projects uh, you guys are working on is data analytics. Give, you, give us a sense of other places you can collect data apart from where you are right now. Yeah. So, you know, we, we've done some, some interesting things. Like if you look at every retailer out there, they all, um, they all pretty much have CCTV throughout their stores, right? And so every store you walk into, you're on camera recording everything. They need to for liability as much as even theft. Um, so they already got cameras around the store. So we, we've we actually modeled in our lab here, 64 cameras pulled in from a, a, a CCTV feed, IP cameras, and we've tracked them. So we, we can maintain the track on the customer. We do this all anonymously. We don't, we don't do any recognition. So we just basically, that's a body. It's moving through the store. We can see where it stops, where, where, you know, where its dwell time is and move that on. We, we need more processing power. Our, our systems at the front give us enough processing power to do that at the front entrance, but to be able to do it from 64 cameras around the store with maybe two or 300 people in the store, we need to put more processing power in the store. And so there's some, some things that we need to work through there to, to make some of that a reality. Um, so, you know, it's, and then some of the other things we're doing is find third-party data sets. Like I say, you, know, we, you can get census, we can get weather quite easily, but um, getting some of the mobile data sets on where you know, customers go from before they hit the store and where they go after. And again, it's all anonymized. We, we have no idea, you know, there's no tracking of, of individual people on this. Um, it's just um, you know, uh, 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 an ID that's come through and gone. We don't store biometric IDs. We don't, uh, we don't store pictures. And, and the only time video leaves the store is if there's a loss prevention event. So the loss prevention event, we stored, you know, like I said, 10 seconds each side, but that's you know, stored similar to CCTV at that point. Mm -hmm. so, so there's no, the data you collect, you don't have any issues with privacy, uh, sort of data issues around privacy. No, and, and we've tried to really steer clear of that. There's companies with more money than us that are going to fight some of those battles. And there's companies that have done some kind of dumb things. You know, we've seen some mall operators, you know, they've, they've been taking pictures of people and uploading them online and then storing biometric IDs. Nothing leaves the store except for that video on a loss prevention event. Nothing leaves the store number one and nothing gets stored. And all we do is do a, a count. So we'll keep a track on, on the person and we'll say, you know, male, approximately 65 years old. And that's all that goes to the database, a counter of 111 kind of to, to that versus, uh, you know, any kind of ID. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're well within the privacy laws of, of any jurisdiction in Canada and the U.S. Okay. So, um, uh, so Canada and U.S., obviously, those are your markets you're tackling right now, but any, any plans to, to work in Europe or anywhere else right now? Yeah. Um, ProSecure wants to get us later this year into um, the U.K., um, so I think we'll see us in the UK fairly quickly and some of their other markets too. So um, I think, uh, you know, as we, as we work through these initial ones, it's, it's going to be time to tie to their schedule, but um, they will give us the means and the distribution to get there. Perfect. Perfect. 
Um, I always have to ask this question, what keeps you up at night? <laughs> yeah, you know, COVID was, COVID was tough, you know, in terms of you as much as it didn't impact as much. That kind of, you just all that worry and unknown in the market for sure. Um, you know, the whole retail landscape is an ever-evolving, ever-evolving place. And we think we've got a good position now, but, you know, <laughs> you know where, where does this go? And, and, you know, the retail apocalypse saying that good retailers are going to survive. And in those essential services, they're going to be, there, there's a need for stores. So, you know, we're going to help them and, uh, and ride their coattails some, to some respect as they reinvest in their businesses and move forward. So, you know, I, I think, you know, those are kind of the key areas for sure. Um, you know, it should be nice to get COVID behind us and be able to, you know, get out and face to face. We're doing lots with Zoom calls. I tell you that we're we're uh, we're getting meetings and, and walking people through. But it's it's always a good thing to actually walk into a retail office and sit down and have a couple hours explain your stuff to them. Mm -hmm. For sure. Um, so I, I did notice you, you and you mentioned you've done a number of acquisitions in the past. Um, do you see that continuing? And if so, what, what are you looking for? Um, mm -hmm. Is it customer relationships or technology or, or, or what? Yeah, um, we were quite opportunistic in those. Like uh, we, we were looking for a partner to you know, have some stores where we could test with initially. And, and we went to this you know, fairly small loft of venture provider in Western Canada. And they, they're like, do you want to buy us? And we're like, okay. <laughs> it was the right price and we just did it, right? And so um, the same with the second one. And, and it was a good strategy to get us some 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 stores to, to be able to test in, and then to put our first systems into for the liquor store network and also gave us some cash flow to help fund our development. Um, we're interested in a few more of those. They, they, they work, they fit our model, but we're also looking you know, for some small tech tuck-ins on technology now that can complement what we're doing with our analytics, for sure. The, the media network, not so much. We really built that out nicely. It's, it's, it's you know, maturing well. Um, we think it can stand on its own two feet against any media network out there. Um, but um, the, the, the digital the data analytics area is something that we're kind of interested in. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Um, well, let, let's open up some questions uh, from the audience. Um, let's see what we got here. Um, okay, here's one right off the top. Uh, as a U.S. resident, uh, can, uh, is there an opportunity to participate in the financing? Um, no, we're actually not marketing it in the U.S. right now, and they actually closed the book this morning. I oh, it, it was literally 24 hours, and it closed. Um, I, we thought it would take longer, but it was, it was already oversubscribed, um, and I appreciate the interest, though, and I appreciate the offer. Um, we, we, are, we, don't, um, we haven't done much in the U.S. market, but we are going to work on the OTC listing a bit, too. Okay, okay good, 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 good. Um, Okay, where are we here? Um, okay, so this is a question revolved around the data. Can you expand on potential analytics and scope? Um, question mark, gender, age, temperature testing uh, for COVID. I, I mean, give us a better sense of what kind of data you can collect. Yeah, so today um, we're doing pure customer count, just, you know, one, two, three, four, you know, how many customers, and we're doing gender. Um, and like I said, we're, we're probably 98% accurate on gender, even 90% waist down. We'd rolled out age and we, uh, something called customer satisfaction score. It's just makes a, 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 a relative happiness score. Um, and they were actually really well in the lab. We put them out there, but then the full compliance on masks hit and our, our accuracy on age just dropped down into the you know, 30s and 40% range. And so it turns out we need a pretty good face shot to do, to do age and the same with the customer satisfaction. So we've parked those for now. Um, those will come back again once you know, when COVID passes, but the, the, it's interesting how much, um, how much we're getting, uh, interest we're getting out of even just the gender and the customers not, you know, the stores are even not knowing. And you know, we, some liquor stores here, you know, this one store it skewed 75% male, but at five o'clock every day, it skewed 60% female. And they didn't realize that, you know, they had to shift in traffic, right? And, you know, the certain times of the day, the females were shopping versus the males. And they had no idea that that was actually really what was going on. And so little things like that. Um, overlaying weather data, overlaying the, you know, the thing we want to get to is, you know, can we predict on a Friday night and the Canucks are playing on TV and it's raining out, what's the traffic of that store going to be, right? And as we build up more data, we can do some of that um, and tie that in in the stores. You know, we, we know that there's, there's traffic changes based on weather. We know there's traffic changes based on whether it's a holiday or not. Some of this is just kind of, you know, you know it, but what is that actual difference? And so we're t doing some of that today. 
Um, that's, those are the basics. That's kind of like the, the bread and butter of getting analytics into the retailers so they can make better decisions around staffing levels, like I say, conversion levels, um, you know, signage, that type of thing. And then um, really pulling in some of those other third party data sets that, that can really um, let them know more about their customer base. Census was interesting. We even just, you know, take free census data and say, okay, the, the, the postal code, the zip code of your store and, and the, the trading of your store, here's what the demographic is. And we had some sort of saying, I had no idea that, you know, it was only 40% Caucasian, you know, kind of thing, right? And, you know, and I had no idea that, um, you know, everybody went to work at 8 a.m. in the morning versus 9 a.m. or 8 a.m., right? It's just, it's, it's, it's interesting just what showing some of these stores, what you, some of the free information that's out there is when you actually put it in a proper data visualization interface. Yeah, wow, it, it's amazing. Um, uh, how, how many, okay, so this question revolves around how many stores you currently have that are operating with one of your units. So 75 today is right. 75 liquor stores in Alberta and BC. And um, do you, I mean, can, is there a number as far as how many you have kind of booked or under contract that you have to provide to? Yeah, so right now there's probably another 25 that will be in um, before the end of March. Um, that we're trying to get over that 100 mark. And then our goal is another 100 by September. So we'll be at 200. And if we want to stop and just do that as a business, at that point, it, it's very close to being a you know, break-even profitable business. If we didn't try to you know, expand and do anything else. And um, you know, th there's some case for that. You just have a little, uh, you know, little business goes off the sunset, gen generates you a lot of money, but obviously our ambitions are a lot bigger than that. Mm -hmm. So we're going to keep doing that just because it makes sense. And, um, we've got resources capable of doing it and it makes us money, but our, you know, our future is really about signing up national, you know, hundreds, thousands of store retailers. Mm -hmm. And I mean, do you have the capacity to build out, like, if you were to get an order for a hundred units tomorrow, how fast can you get these things built? Yeah, so right now, if we had an order this morning at like, say, 9 a.m., we could have it out and delivered at 2 in the afternoon. So we make them on demand. Greg's had, you know, all the manufacturing expertise he did with these aerospace companies. We have a lean manufacturing line set up here. We could produce 10 a day if we knew we had to. Um, so that, that's kind of our scale today. ProSecure gives us a completely other scale. They have a manufacturing facility in the Czech Republic. That's mm -hmm. where they produce all of their loss prevention pieces today and some of their camera stuff and some of their other things that they do. And so... We also just part of us producing ourselves was to be able to prototype the processes that you need to produce uh, these systems, especially since we have we've got some pretty, pretty non normal pieces inside them in terms of how we do the antenna shaping, how we do some shielding around it, how we make this work with, you know, to prevent the electronic noise. Um, the circuit boards are all our own design. It's all our own software. We obviously use contract manufacturers to produce cir circuit boards. But mm -hmm. um, we're transferring all that knowledge to ProSecure so they can actually produce these for us mm -hmm. and for themselves. Yeah. Um, so you, you mentioned the liquor store, the 75 stores there, or the liquor um, um, outfit. But um, are, you, are you in discussions with other sort of major retailers or major customers? The name Costco has come up in the question here. Uh, you know, collecting data for Costco, I can just imagine, would be like digging for gold. Um, yeah. Costco is an interesting one. You know, I've dealt with them for years, but they, they actually don't use um, loss prevention systems at the front of stores or you know, electronic orders advance. They, they have their checker that analyzes your receipt as you go out the door. And so you know, the Costco's a little bit old school there. I remember um, when we were dealing with the photo area and they put test screens up in like 10 locations where they, they actually had digital displays up. And Jim Senegal, who's you know, former CEO of the chairman, walked in the store and said, that's not Costco. Get those screens out of here. Mm -hmm. And so you know, they, they've got their way of doing business and they're so successful. I'm so, you know, I'm, I'm so um, uh, you know, in awe of some of the things Costco does. But um, other retailers, we, uh, we've reserved the right with ProSecure that we can actually go after certain businesses ourselves and certain retailers. So we haven't turned everything over to them. They've got named retailers that they will have a first right to market on if they put enough systems in it. Essentially, it's an exclusive. But if they don't do enough, we can still go to them with ourselves, with a partner. And we are targeting um, retailers that I was already working on before that pro-secure relationship. Um, we're mm -hmm. still uh, going to go ahead with those. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you mentioned uh, sort of a competitive landscape from a loss, loss prevention standpoint and, and hardware providers there. But may, maybe tell us on the competitive side, what does it look like more on the, the data analytics uh, competition? How do you fare against this? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And so when I was at Staples, um, you know, they, they, they were crying for this data and they took five stores and they put sensors all through the stores, you know, one to track traffic coming to the front door to do that heat mapping to the store. It cost them $25,000 per store to put all this stuff in there. It doesn't sound like all that much to get good data, but when you got 1500 stores, they, they could not afford it. They didn't have the capital to do it. Right. And so um, there's a bunch of companies doing some of that retail tech, some of the, you know, the, the store mapping and, and following the customer journey and that kind of thing. But the fairly expensive solutions, we're giving them, like I say, about 90% of what they need by just putting the system at the front door and it costs the retailer nothing. Um, and then they get it on top of that, right? And, you know, obviously it costs them something if, if we're charging a fee, but they're going to make money out of it. Um, so I think you know, if you analyze us for some, for some of the pure uh tech plays out there we're, we're quite different we're quite different from how you know some of the companies will go about doing that kind of thing and there there's a slew of companies looking at you know helping retailers reinvent retail um but we're trying to we kind of have a foot really grounded in, in what the retailers do operationally today the old school piece of the loss prevention task stuff tied that into our into the future revenue stream mm -hmm. so i I'm, this the question i think i i'm gonna ask in this format did you ever plug into any of the other systems that are already in place or are you guys more standalone right now? So um, interesting, we can take, if say they had one of those old systems on each side of the door, we could take one out on the one side of the door and put ours in on the other and leave the other one there. And we would still work with it. We'd be compatible with it. Um, we work with the same tags and labels and, and all the, the pieces of, you know, they put on boxes or clothing or bottles and whatever. We detect the same tags and sensors that they do. Um, so they don't, the store doesn't need to change any of that. So we can coexist with them. Um, our preference is to take them completely out <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and put our own in, but we could coexist. Okay, perfect. Um, okay, so you did mention uh, you guys run roughly an 85, 90% gross margin, which is... Uh, that, that, that's what we, where we would be when we're in the SaaS model. Sorry, okay, if I wasn't gotcha. clear on that. Yeah, so we're not at that today. Within the liquor store network, we think it's in a 40 to 50% gross margin. You know, we're, we're fronting everything at that point. But when we bring a partner in that's going to front the hardware and we just do the, the, oh, okay. the, yeah. the, 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 the platform, our margins will go up. You know, our top line revenue will obviously, it'll be capped a bit because we have to share revenue with the hardware people. But our revenue is going to be pure at that point. Okay. Um, so, so going forward, what, what would you say is the best metrics that investors should uh, sort of watch for to really measure how well you guys are doing? Yeah, the immediate catalysts are these pilots that we're rolling out with ProSecure. So, you know, watch for the definitive agreement for, with ProSecure, watch for the announcements of the pilots, the expansion of the pilots, and then going to the full rollout. Those are, those are some of the keys because you know, we're working hard on those and those are those are the company shaping pieces going forward. We'll have some technology announcements in there, a couple more patent announcements, but it's really about um, how we how we can scale with those, those larger retailers. I think that's if you're you know interested in investing in company or you are invested in companies, that's that's what you want to be watching. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Um, okay, so I mean you're you're still a relatively young uh, public company. Uh, you guys are raising four and a half million dollars right now. Maybe give us a sense if you can of the shareholder base. Um, who's participating in the financing? They have institutional ownership. Um, yeah. You know, what, what can you tell us? Yeah, well, when we did the RTO and we raised the 2.8, we did it all in Vancouver. We, we thought, well, we'll go to Toronto, we'll go to Montreal, some of the, you know, the normal basis for a Canadian company, but we actually filled it all right in Vancouver. Um, post the RTO, um, management uh, board employees own just right about the 50% mark. Um, so um, we're, we're probably 42%, uh, you know, on, on a dilutive basis. I think right now, uh, management um, holds, and that's my partner Greg and myself for the most part. Um, and so we we still have a big stake in, you know, where the company's going in the future. Um, this round right now, we did it through a, a brokerage in Toronto, a securities firm in Toronto called Beacon Securities, um, and also Haywood uh, out of Vancouver is part of the syndicate, and PI Financial out of Vancouver is part of the syndicate, and it was. The first, the first round was very broker driven. This one's been more institutional. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, great. Um, well, listen, I mean, we, we've sort of come to the end of my questions and the end of the listeners' questions. Um, Kyle, is there any kind of parting message, any key takeaway you want our listeners to walk away with today? Yeah, you know, I, I probably hammered it too many times. If people want to hear it again, but it, you know, it's really, really for us about you know the front entrance of that store, um, using the loss prevention as a means to get our advertising screens in there and our analytics, and then 
driving those recurring revenue streams. It's, for us, it's not so much about the hardware. It's really the hardware's enabler to get us those, those recurring revenue streams. And that's, um, we think, um, where the company's going to profit and where, where investors that believe in us will, will be able to um, come along for the ride and profit as well. Fantastic. Uh, if somebody wants to get more information, what's, uh, what's your website? The website is Inio Solutions Inc. Sorry, it's a bit long. I N E O S O L U T I O N S I N C dot com. Perfect. Uh, okay, today we've had Kyle Hall, CEO of Inio Tech Corp. Kyle Allen, thank you. It's, it's been great to get to know uh, the company. Great. Thank you for having me, everyone. Appreciate it.